Welcome back to part 3 of my Rob Roy vertical steam engine build. In this video I'll be looking at the steam chest and the valve components. So first I milled off the surfaces of the chest and then cleaned up any casting defects using a file. The slide valve requires two slots to be milled for the fitment of the valve stem when assembled. So these were marked out and cut. This valve was made from aluminium and I had to remake the valve later as I'd made a mistake on the exhaust recess and made it too long but I didn't realise this until the engine was run for the first time so the next one I made was made from brass. The valve stem was made from silver steel and an M3 thread formed to suit the valve slot nut. As you see here, the valve block simply slides up and down, covering and uncovering the inlet ports to allow the steam or air to operate the cylinder. To keep the valve stem running parallel, I decided to make a keeper. This was then milled to a rough size and then holes were drilled for the fixings. I keep a set of drills specifically for brass and plastics and these have had the tips reground to have a zero or a negative rake angle which prevents the drill from snatching into the work. These are spray painted yellow for identification and they allow me to confidently drill brass without incident. Once drilled, the position for the keeper was marked upon the chassis and then the holes were drilled and tapped. The keeper still requires some final shaping but you can see it loosely fixed here with a reamed hole for the valve stem. The port faces dictate a quarter inch valve movement so the eccentric will require the axle bore to be one eighth of an inch offset from the centre to allow for reciprocation of the valve. This was prepared for marking out and clamped in a V-block and measurements were double checked. Then the centre line was marked and zeroed for reference to the offset. The offset was then set on the scribe and the position marked out on the job. The vertical centre line was then scribed to complete the marking out. This was then centre dotted for alignment in the lathe. Using a dead centre between the tailstock and the job, the punch mark was aligned in the four-draw chuck using a dial indicator until it was running within one thou. This was then centre drilled and opened up for reaming to the axle diameter. A test fit was checked and then a hole was drilled and tapped in readiness for a clamping grub screw. A mandrel was made with the milled flat to accommodate the grub screw and the eccentric was now fixed to the mandrel with locking compound and left overnight to set before being returned to the lathe. 
the boss of the eccentric could now be turned away to become concentric with the axle bore. This was then faced to final dimension and then released from the mandrel using heat to break the chemical bond. The eccentric now needs connecting to the valve stem via a connecting rod, so a length of brass was turned to reduce its diameter for the conrod coupler. And then further marked out for the main stem and reduced further to suit my design. The end which connects to the eccentric had the radius turned off to allow for connection with the fixings and then the rod was parted off to length ready for milling. Two flats were milled for the eccentric strap connection and the other end was milled to create a clevis fork connection joint. The other half of the clevis fork was made on the lathe to suit the valve stem and then slotted on the mill to mate with the connecting rod. This was then super glued together for drilling and reaming. A 3mm nut and bolt pivot was turned from steel hex bar to join the components and test fitted. The corners will later have radiuses filed on them to allow the clevis to rotate or pivot without binding. Holes now needed to be drilled for the fixing screws to connect to the eccentric strap. To make the gaskets, I blued up the face of the steam chest using engineer marking which was then pressed onto the gasket paper to imprint the pattern of the holes. This was then cut out and the holes were carefully punched out using a parallel pin punch against a block of hardwood. The internal cutouts were then made using a scalpel blade and checked that they were a good fit. The cylinder cover gaskets could be marked out with a pencil and the same technique was used to punch the holes. The full set of gaskets were then checked to ensure that all the holes lined up correctly. For the piston, a length of aluminium was chucked in the lathe and a centre hole was short tapped to accept the threaded end of the piston rod. This was secured in the hole and then sawn off over size. The collet chuck was used to maintain concentricity with the shaft and the piston was then faced and turned to suit the dimension of the cylinder bore, making regular test fits to the piston as I went along. 
The rough casting of the flywheel was tidied up with a file and then mounted in the lathe. The centre boss was used to get the flywheel centred as close as possible using my dial test indicator. The outer rim was first turned until all the low points were removed. Then the outer rim was turned down as far as the chuck jaws would allow to give me a concentric reference when the flywheel was flipped in the chuck. Using a boring bar, the inner rim was turned away just short of the spokes until the casting was cleaned up of any low spots. The tool post was then adjusted to allow the centre boss to be fully turned without interference with the flywheel spokes. This was then turned and faced to dimension and then a file was used to break any remaining sharp edges. After the first half of the flywheel was turned, the cast iron shavings were cleaned up ready for the other side. The chuck jaws were then reversed so that I could hold the flywheel by the turned inner rim with the outside jaws and use the pre-turned surface on the outside as reference to clocking the wheel true. The same turning operations could now be repeated on the flywheel and the outside rim could also now be turned in one operation. Finally, the centre boss was drilled and reamed to suit the axle, ensuring that the flywheel will run true. I then set up my tool post drilling jig on an angle to be able to drill a hole in the boss for a securing grub screw. This was then tapped out to M4 using a long reach tap wrench. The engine now has an almost complete set of components so it was built up and a test run was performed in which it allowed me to identify any areas requiring attention, of which there were a few. But overall, I'm quite happy with the build so far. So please join me in part 4, where I will begin to tidy up the loose ends and make a start on the painting and adding some refinements to the engine. And of course, a serious test run for you to enjoy. See you soon 
Thanks for watching.